Um, thank you for coming uh, in large numbers to today's seminar. I'm Simone Gabellani from Chimas Research Foundation and the speaker today will be Giulio Castelli. He's a researcher from the Water Harvesting Lab of the University of Florence, I think since the last three, four years. Uh, the title of the seminar is uh, Experiences of Community Participation in Water Resource Management and Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, Giulio Castelli is actively involved in several research projects in East Africa, Central and South America. Uh, that deals with the uh, aspect connected to water harvesting, uh, water resources management, and uh, participatory approaches in uh, international development. So I thank Giulio for uh, his availability. Um, you have uh, about 40, 45 minutes for your talk. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have time for uh, question or comments. Uh, I invite the participant to use uh, the chat box uh, of Zoom for a question. Uh, you can write uh, your question in uh, the chat box uh, anytime during the presentation of uh, Giulio Castelli. And uh, I will collect all the questions uh, and uh, I will pose them to Giulio uh, at the end of his speech. Um, if you prefer, to do the questions by voice at the end after the presentation of uh, Giulia Castelli, please uh, raise your hand and uh, we will unmute you so you, you can talk. Uh, thank you all again and thank you, Giulio. So I, I leave the floor uh, to Giulio Castelli for his speech. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Simone, for the introduction, and, and thanks again to, to, to the overall uh, Chima Foundation for this invitation. Very happy to, to, to show a little bit of what, what we have done in, in these last years about uh, participation. And, uh, I'm going to share my screen for the presentation. And you see here, uh, this is the, the lovely uh, flyer that they made for me and th thanks again i mean uh, so i decided to use it as uh, first slide so ju just a couple of, of reminders uh, basically i will deal with participation but but i'm basically an environmental engineer and i have a phd in uh, agricultural engineering and especially in, in agricultural water resources management and, and I started also using participatory methodologies uh, for uh, natural resources management, because when you deal with rural uh, development and, and when you deal with agriculture, both in terms of managing the, the resource and, and also managing disaster, you have to deal with people. I mean, in generally, you have to deal with people, but uh, specifically when you deal with rural development, you get in touch with these teams. Uh, so um, there is also a large body of literature on it um, that show how engineers dedicated to agriculture, they start to do this. But basically, I'm just a practitioner. So what I will do today is just to give you a brief introduction about some basics concept of participation. And then basically, I will go through two or three experiences that, that we have with our research group, which, which to me are kind of nice uh, array of different uh, case studies that, that can be maybe insightful for everyone. And I hope you, you enjoy and please uh, feel, feel free to interrupt me anytime, or maybe we will have a discussion at the end. So I... I'd like to start with this uh, simple slide about participation because uh, many times uh, we talk about participation is quite a nice word. If you are writing a project, if you are writing a proposal, you always nowadays tend to talk about participation, stakeholders involvement, and, and a lot of projects, I'm sure, also your projects, they now have this keyword or the now involve some kind of uh, 
participation and stakeholders involvement, but what does it mean? So if you look at the dictionary, participation means the fact that you take part or become involved in something. This is quite uh, a wide definition and, and, and that's the point. It's something that is not clear. So when you talk about participation, you cannot really deal it in general terms. You have to dig a little bit into the definition, different approaches and different significance that this that may have. I will discuss a little bit of, of what I did because I'm basically a researcher. And I think this is a little bit our, uh, our focus for this seminar because we are not uh, dealing uh, really with the on the ground implementation project, but also with a little bit of research. Um, and I will show you how from a general participation, we can go to a participatory research framework and how this participatory research framework is useful when you deal with water resources management, disaster risk reduction, and so on. So first of all, let, let's dive a little bit in this term, participation. And this is quite a brief literature review about some general um, references uh, which, which relate to participation in general and participation in uh, land and water management uh, projects. So first of all, we all acknowledge that participation is a very broad concept. And the second important thing is that participation means different things, to different people. And uh, I, maybe this is even more uh, easy to understand if you look at it in some kind of political terms. Um, participation is often used by different people with different ideological position that gave it different meanings. So we will, we will go through it later on, but uh, sometimes uh, communities are asked to participate to show them something that is already decided. Sometimes they are asked to participate to decide something. And, and this is still called participation. And this is still called participation by whoever applies one of the two concepts. But, but the results and also the values and, and the goals that you want to get, they are totally different. And then we come to the next uh, point. So participation is uh, quite a contested concept that uh, produce a wide range of competing uh, meanings. So different people give different meanings to participation and different application. So you always have to think about how you define participation, whom it is expected to involve, what is expected to achieve, and how is to be brought about. So you don't have one participation. You have different levels of participation. These are the publication that, that uh, I mean, I used for, for this review that they are here for, for your interest, but just to show that there is a quite broad amount of literature about it. And uh, one thing that I find uh, particip particularly useful, even as an engineer, is this kind of graph that is called the participatory ladder. So it's, it's quite... Uh, um, clear to me because it, it, it allow you to understand how you can have totally different uh, processes, even if uh, you always talk uh, about participation. And, and there is a long literature about this kind of uh, ladder that is basically a classification of different uh, um, way of involve people. This is quite a, a, a good uh, example. So you see that you start with very low levels of participation. The first two are manipulation and therapy, which are some kind of manipulated informing. So in, in many projects, you just ask people to participate in assemblies or in meetings to inform them. The, you don't really want uh, uh, them to, to take decision, take action, give you information. So 
information is level three, but you see that that maybe sometimes you have also projects where, where people are, are involved just to convince them about something, which is still called participation, but you see that without a framework that clearly identifies which is the goal of participation is actually the opposite. You call people to be informed in, in just one direction to make them agree with you. So it's totally non-participation, okay? You, you, in a way you prevent them to take a decision. Then if you climb up to the ladder, you see that you have different uh, increasing levels. So you can ask people to participate you can um, ask people to participate for informing, for consulting them. So to have some ideas that you did really not use, to have a placation effect of them on them. So basically to, to just explain your choices that maybe they don't agree with. And in a certain way you, you allow them, you, maybe you do not convince them, you do not manipulate them, but you at least agree with them. And then, Going up in what you call degrees of citizen power, you have uh, some way to involve people which they are more uh, intense, like the partnership, delegated power, and citizen control. So you see that if you go on the internet, you will find different ways of, of view this ladder. This is another one that is quite nice, that gives you additional information. Um, but basically, I mean, the idea is that you do not do participation just like this. When you do participation, you, you have always to clarify, understand, and to set your limit. I'm doing participation, why? I'm doing participation to do this, do this, so. So basically, and um, just now coming back, to the, the, the title of this section, I found particip participatory research uh, specifically a very good framework uh, to deal with uh, land and water management project, disaster risk reduction, and so on. Uh, so participatory research is defined at a wider range of methods that basically allow you to conduct a research process together with people. This means uh, uh, that people basically take control of, of the, the work, take action, and you just not impose your uh, vi vision as a researcher. You always try to balance two perspectives, the perspective of the researcher, the perspective of the technical experts, and uh, uh, the, the perspective of people that are dealing uh, every day with the issue you are studying. Okay, and, and it's not something that you do only for uh, um, part, make people participating in the analysis, but also to, to leave to them a benefit, to leave to them some extra instrument to analyze their own uh, uh, situation and so on. And it can basically done with a wider range of methodologies, techniques that you have to know or that you may learn, but you should always keep in mind uh, the, the, the points that I mentioned before. When you do participatory research, the participation does not mean only the uh, fact that you involve people to get information, but, but you involve people also to shape the research to shape your analysis. So I give you a little bit of, of, of concept and I'm going to, to do now a second part that will be, you will be, it will be very, um, I mean, extensive because I'm, I'm just giving you some, some real life example of my research. But, but let me just make a premise that will be useful to understand why I'm linking the uh, participatory ladder, the participation with the participatory research. And then coming back uh, to the ladder. So we are talking today about uh, um, participation in the framework of disaster risk reduction and uh, of uh, natural resources management. 
So these activities, they, they are very specific in, in the broad of, of science and technology matters because they are activities that really deal with, with the landscape, with the terrain, with, with the land in which people lived. And they actually deal with their lives. If you think about disaster risk reduction, you, you, you know that a large part of disaster risk reduction relies on the participation of citizenship. You know that a large part also of water management, especially, especially in rural areas, deals uh, with uh, uh, the role of farmers at the farm level and so on. So it, it's quite different to other kinds of participation in science, like, I don't know, you have an industry, you have a process for creating something and you do participation with the em employees to create a better uh, function of a value chain or something. When you talk about land and water management project, people are players, people are stakeholders, people are actors. And as, uh, as, as we wrote in the presentation of this uh, um, webinar, you can really have a good outcome only if you involve them. So to make this story short, this is why I give you this uh, uh, overview of, on participation. The idea here is that when we deal with land and water management research or land and water management project, my perspective, that of course is mine, is that you can obtain a really good outcome only if you go in the upper part of the ladder. So in what you call degrees of citizen power. In this framework, and this is what I will present with the examples, my personal perspective is that uh, with the participatory research approach in the phase of preparation of the project, in the phase of assessment of some projects, also in the phase of, I mean, scientific implementation, you can get very, very good results. Of course, if you take care about some specific issue that I will show you now in the example. So this is why I, um, I give you a little bit of an introduction, which to me is quite important to, to understand what does participation means. And now I will show you a little bit of, of projects done with the participatory research approach. So the first example uh, that uh, I wanted to show today, it's about research that I did uh, basically some years ago for, for my master thesis in Ethiopia. And that was about uh, uh, participation with, with, with a very qu quite, uh, uh, I mean, high level in the ladder for the modernization of, of spate irrigation systems. I mean, I don't know if, if uh, uh, you are uh, in touch a little bit with the hydrology, especially of the northern part of Ethiopia. I know that someone here is. Um, but basically, a um, large part of the hydrological system of, of, of the north of Ethiopia, but also of many areas of the world, the Orno Africa, but the south of the Mediterranean and, and um, Iran, Iraq, uh, two, they, they are based on ephemeral rivers. So rivers that they are dry uh, most of the year and that, that they have maybe like from 10 to 15 events of flow, which are actually flooding events. So th these very large dry rivers, they, they are flooded at the same, uh, in, at the same time in, in a very, very short uh, uh, timing while on, on large part of the year, they are dry. And spate irrigation is a specific form of water resources management that is based on the diversion of flood water from seasonal river beds. It's quite uh, applied around the world, is kind of neglected, or at least it was neglected in 2013-14 when I did this research, but is also relevant for adaptation to climate change. This is also because a lot of river systems that they are slowly shifting from a perennial um, hydrology to uh, an ephemeral hydrology. And you see, I mean, or at, at least in Ethiopia, you see quite uh, great uh, dichotomy 
between traditional state irrigation system that, that are like the one that you see in, in this uh, picture, so systems where uh, you have uh, basically a dry river bed, where uh, irrigation is basically run by uh, farmers with no external inputs, where the flood, the flood water is diverted with uh, art artificial bands that are uh, built uh, within the, the riverbed, but this, uh, I'm looking for the laser pointer, this, this one are made by the farmers with uh, heart, they, they are made by stones, brushwood and so on. And then you can have uh, uh, modernized pet irrigation schemes that this one is in Pakistan and sometimes are quite large. So you see here, this is a dry riverbed. Now there is a flood, but most of the year is dry and there is a large diversion system which brings water to the farms. So we were working in the north of Ethiopia, Tigray region, and, and I, 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 I was reading a little bit about the topic. And, and if you see this, uh, this region, if you see this, uh, this basically spate irrigation system that, that are in Ethiopia, you can find that there, there was a large effort in modernizing the spate irrigation system. So the government was going to the farmers that were running a traditional uh, spate irrigation system. So diverting floods with uh, very, very weak and poor materials. And they told them, listen, we, we will, do a new system, we will use uh, concrete and we will make an uh, innovative system that will be more resistant to flood because of course, if you work on a river that has flooding, uh, you, you have a high degree of damage to the structure. But this that you see here was the result. So the modernization failed, the new system were not working with sometimes uh, uh, very, I mean, this is a picture that I took myself. So you, you see how this uh, channel was broken by the first flood and so on. And you see yeah, this, 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 this wall was from a diversion structure and you see clearly from here how the first flood arrived and, and completely crashed the structure because you have a huge amount of water arriving at the same time. So basically with, with also colleagues from the Netherlands, we, we made an analysis and also based on literature that show how, I mean, in, in the design approach for modernizing uh, spate irrigation systems, the, the designers take into account uh, only very little the, the knowledge of the physical characteristics of, of the very extreme environment with all these floods that you have in Ethiopia. And they use a project design based on uh, um, the approach that they would have used for perennial rivers. Totally wrong. The farmers' knowledge of, of the river system of this hydrology was not taken into account. As a result, they had a very limited number of successful intervention, while on the other end, in this area where we did the study, Raya Valley, which is in Tigray region, there was evidence that farmer-led spate irrigation system, traditional irrigation system, they were performing better than modernized one. So basically farmers alone, without modernization, without anything, they were more efficient than farmers that were, uh, were gifted with a modernized concrete irrigation system. So what we did with this research was to develop and apply a participatory approach to design improvements in spate irrigation system based on the identification of the problems of, of one sample irrigation spate irrigation scheme and the incorporation of farmer knowledge and preferences into the design. So basically what we did, we, we went to an irrigation system, we asked uh, to the farmers which are the problems and, and we try to discuss with them, let's design something new altogether. And, and let's try to have an improvement of, of the previous approach that was a failure basically. 
So we, we use an approach uh, based on, on, on diagnostic analysis that was basically when, when you deal with the rural system was an appraisal of uh, um, all the, the, the system, the rural system, not only the irrigation system, based on the identification of most relevant problems. So what we do, we analyze the system, we do an analysis of the problems uh, that we found in the system. We try to rank the problems and we try to design solution for the most important problems. All this was made in a participatory way. So from the system analysis to the design, we involve uh, people. And this is how we did, because I told you that participatory research is basically a huge uh, cluster of different techniques. So we use what we call a participatory rural appraisal uh, that was defined by, by Robert Chambers. It's, it's quite a useful methodology if you want to do participation in, in Italy, like in Ethiopia. And there's a family of approaches and methods that enable uh, rural or urban communities to analyze their own system and share their knowledge. And the key concept is that everyone is, is capable of expressing their idea about uh, problems, about system management. If you create an environment where they can express themselves, basically, if you establish a common language between the researchers and the, and the people to be involved. And in this sense, the researcher should be a little bit of a facilitator. So what we did is we apply, and, and this is quite frequent if you do participatory research. So you, you, you try to use uh, um, exercises or analysis tools that you can do all together, participatory mapping, historical diagrams, also transect walks, that me meaning going along a line and, and walking along a transect in a rural system, analyzing uh, the different section of the system. You can see clearly from, from the picture. And, and, and these technologies, these, these tools, they are not only used in Ethiopia. I mean, if you get in touch with someone that is doing participation in Italy, they are using exactly this. And, uh, and, and, and what we did was to join this uh, participatory rural appraisal that is essentially a, a way of analyzing problems and system with the methodology that is called participatory design. So the participatory design is a methodology that is used, I mean, also in software analysis, process uh, design, industrial uh, innovation, and so on. And it's based on, on, on three uh, simple uh, parts. The first part is called initial exploration of works. That means that when you enter in one system can be like uh, an industry, a farm, an office, uh, you start uh, staying uh, with the participants the farmers, the workers, uh, uh, the, the, the office uh, um, workers, and you try to understand the everyday routine. And you try, you, try, you try to discuss about the planning, about the technical aspect, about the management issue, and so on. So for this, specific part of participatory design, the participatory rural appraisal was just what we were needing because it was itself a technology that allow you to get in touch with one system, to be introduced in a system, to discuss with participants the issue, leaving to them their own way of expressing themselves, uh, allowing them to explain properly the problems, not going there saying this is an approach that I want to use for designing my solution and so on. Then you have a discovery process uh, that is a second find of a second phase, sorry, of participatory design that allow you to establish objectives, parameters, and criteria for, for designing something. And then you have the prototyping that is the design itself. So three steps. You discuss the issue, you get in touch with the system, rural system, office, uh, whatever. You try to set the objective of the innovation of the design that you want to do, and then you do the design. And this is how we mix a little bit the methodology. So 
The system analysis uh, was the initial exploration of work, the discovery process, so establishment of uh, the objective was the problem analysis, the problem ranking, and the selection of solution, and the prototyping was basically uh, the design of the solution. The participatory tools and appraisal were used to, 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 to basically all the process, apart from the last part of the design that being an engineer I do on my laptop. So this was a little bit the results. You see a little bit the maps that we did and so on. And uh, we discuss with farmer. We also do plenary meetings uh, discussing all together. We did the ranking of problems uh, basically with the, with the physical support. So with some sheets, uh, not because people are uh, unable to discuss, but but you can do this in Italy. You can do this uh, in Sweden. You can do this in Ethiopia. If you don't have a support that uh, help you to, to fix the idea, to, to see the ranking on the ground, people will get confused. So this is why we use this. And, and this, this was a nice memory. So being uh, like something, sometimes working with, with illiterate farmers, we have some sheets that were describing the problem with the text and also with the drawing. So this was like the excessive sedimentation on the crop and this was the flooding of, uh, of the crops. And this was the local Amharic language. So from all this process, we basically find out uh, uh, a co coherent and shared ranking with the farmers, uh, like uh, 40 to 50 families of farmers using the spate irrigation system that we studied. And it was quite interesting because, of course, the, the, the first two problems uh, to improve the system, they were the, the weakness of diversion structure and the lateral erosion. But then we find out the third and fourth uh, problems, uh, they were not problems related to irrigation itself, uh, but problems related to flooding, uh, only to flooding. This was, in one sense, very clear. Because of course you are a rural community, you live close to a river that, that is doing a lot of uh, uh, basically uh, is do a lot of flooding. It has a very violent and intermittent hydrology, and and most of all you are poor, so you you try to keep everything close by because you don't have a car. So it's clear that you have a problem about flooding because when when you don't have the right amount of uh, water and you have like a very very strong flood not the ordinary flood of course your house is destroyed okay so this is a little bit uh, uh, this was a little bit ob obvious in a way but but if you look at the research and if you look at the project that were done before on this topic no one ever talked about flooding okay this was the last time that we developed something saying listen you want to improve these uh, irrigation systems please of course you have technical problems about irrigation structure but it's clear that people they are at risk of flooding and this was because in in the previous processes in the previous design Yes, th there was the, the tentative uh, to help the farmers, but no one asked them, okay, can we discuss all together which are the problems of your livelihood here? Then we, we try to, to select a little bit uh, uh, of suitable solution and to design them, of course, in an area where data were completely lacking. We, rely on the farmer experience about water levels and this is something that is clearly done also in Italy because uh, you, you have a lot of citizens observatories about uh, uh, water and flooding and then in, in these final sections uh, uh, we also bring uh, some uh, some papers and we try to sketch some design about the solutions technical solution because farmers uh, especially these farmers they are expert about irrigation management. They, they did manage their irrigation system for, for decades. 
this is why they have a traditional state irrigation system. So we rely a lot on their technical experience. So basically we try to design new diversion structures and, and a new uh, gabion walls uh, to prevent uh, the, the flooding and the erosion of fields that were close to the river. So the main problem emerged for diversion structure was that uh, this diversion structure made by farmers, they were usually wa washed away by flood, preventing uh, irrigation. So they were working with uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, structure made by earth and wood and brushes. And of course, they, they would have to redo this structure every year because every year the structures were damaged. So what the farmers say is that the present shape of the diversion structure was satisfactory. But now let me come back to the to the initial um, slides and I will give you an insight. So this is like a traditional diversion structure is just something that that it's in the middle of the river and divide the main river flow and the flow to the irrigation system and this is a modernized uh, system this one modernized system that is working ethiopia is different in ethiopia they try to do modernized system in the way and they, they crash completely so why farmers they were saying that the present uh, shape of diversion structure was uh, successful because basically and i'm coming back to the drawing they had a system made like this okay so they, they had not one but multiple canals that were diverting the flood into the the fields and in this way they had a system that was not opposing to the flow okay because it was not a system where the flood water was arriving like that but was just a system that was dividing the flow in two with less uh, uh, hydraulic pressure and moreover they had uh, multiple intakes they don't have only one so if one is is broken down the, they have other three or four or five that are still working while if you have only one and if the one is destroyed you can't work anymore so first lesson learned by the farmers this uh, irrigation system usually broke down because the water is very powerful so you do not do only one intake canal you do more and if one broke down you work with the second one then uh, um, they also tell us that gabions were a suitable material and this was quite clear apparently clear to, to me and the farmers but not to the previous uh, designers because gabions uh, the, first of all they are permeable and this is reducing the aerodynamic pressure on them and second of all they are flexible much better than concrete so if if there is, a, a, I mean, one flood that is hitting on a gabion, the gabion can adapt the shape. While if a powerful flood is, is hitting on concrete that is rigid, the concrete will crash. And the second, uh, uh, the third part is that, that, that the highlighted is that the damages usually occur in the first part of, of, of this uh, structure. So you have only to use gabions in the first part of the structure. So we, based on these uh, ideas made together with the farmers, we make some technical uh, calculation and we design a new diversion structure. That was the, the, also the, the case for a gabion wall. So the gabion wall, we follow basically the same reasoning that gabions were a suitable material that of course, uh, the fact that the, 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 the river banks were collapsing due to the flooding there was a problem for the farmers and so on and in the end what we managed to do is was a design and this design i mean to all the problems that farmers highlighted was uh, uh, with a security factor above one so that was 
potentially working and, and we get these results. The, there is a paper about it. Actually, it was done uh, a little bit after the, the research. The research was 2014 and the paper is 2018, but because we tried to, to put together everything with a shared uh, uh, framework. And uh, this was a little bit to explain how you can trigger uh, participation to better manage, in this case, an irrigation system that is also prone to flood, taking into account uh, farmer experience, uh, but also involving them in decision and allowing them establishing uh, um, new priorities and also to explain to you different problems, like the one of flooding that no one detected before. So th this was personally a great experience and I think a good project. Of course, it was not perfect and we will have time to discuss later on maybe, but that was a fair example. So I have two examples more. I, one is from Myanmar and one from Italy. They are actually shorter and uh, I, I think I will finish around uh, like uh, two 50 to 55. So, Simone, please tell yeah, me. Yeah, please go fine. on. It's fine. So, the second uh, um, analysis uh, was a little bit more plain and was done in, in Myanmar. Um, and it was uh, about uh, the analysis of sustainable land and water management practices for integrated rural development. And it was an experience we did uh, within a cooperation project uh, um, funded by the Italian Development Cooperation Agency. And it show you a different degree of, on how you can participate. Because sometimes uh, it's good to participate with a lot of people to involve very low stakeholders. But sometimes it's not good. Sometimes you have really to acknowledge that, uh, of course, you have to get information about uh, local settings with, uh, I mean, a participatory approach, but uh, maybe you have to interact uh, with technical experts. And this is what we did in Myanmar. So basically Myanmar, um, and I will come back on the country later on, you will see, but is a country where you, you technically have a lot of water, you have tier two, two or three very huge rivers, totally different from Ethiopia, not uh, uh, small catchments with, uh, with very huge floods, but huge alluvial uh, uh, plains. And uh, all the development, water development of the country is based on very, very, very large scale irrigation systems. And also the cities are quite big, like in, in Southeast Asia. On the other end, uh, there is actually no information about which kind of uh, land and water development intervention you will need in small rural settlements, in small rural areas. And, and, and this is a huge uh, problem because, of course, the country has a lot of inhabitants and, and basically you don't have uh, uh, you don't have a lot of information about these uh, settlements, but you do have a lot of people living there. So basically uh, what we did in this, in this case was to, to organize a training in, with, with the rural development experts of, uh, of the Ministry of Agriculture. And we give to them a series of information about uh, suitable and innovative land and water management techniques to be, I mean, tested and developed in Myanmar. And, and basically, I mean, we, we let them a little bit self-organize because what we did uh, is that we asked them uh, at the end of the course to divide them in groups according to their own feeling and, and to say in their area of intervention because they, they were all uh, rural development officers. We were working in the capital of Myanmar, which is called Naipido. And these people, they came from, from different parts of the country. So they self-organize to be uh, to be coming from different parts of the country, they group uh, in, 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 in groups uh, related to, to different geographical areas. And from those geographical areas, 
uh, they, they propose different uh, um, different technologies to be implemented. So basically we train them on sustainable land and water management, and then we ask to them, okay, according to this course that we did, can you give me, can you give us a little bit of information about which, uh, which technology may be useful in, in your area of work and which are the issue? And this, this was uh, like, uh, a little bit of an explanation of the results. You see that in many areas they 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 ask to work with water safety plants. In other areas, with different technologies, water harvesting, soil and water bioengineering, and and also raising awareness about land degradation because sometimes farmers they cultivate with no attention at all for the soil that they degrade. And uh, what what we see. I mean, what we saw with this uh, with this approach was that water harvesting, water safety plan, and soil bioengineering were recommended. But uh, I mean, the fact of involving uh, like a group of rural development experts with different parts of the of, of, from different parts of the country allow us also to get a little bit on on an insight about uh, which regions have the worst water management infrastructures. And these regions were the poorest. So, I mean, this, this was not uh, so difficult to anticipate. But what, what we find out, of course, this was just an exercise at the end of a training course and the objective of the project water course. But we managed to get some insights with relatively low effort from people that were actually experts. So, this, this, this was a little bit the main takeaway of this short example that uh, I gave, uh, is that uh, do, do not be confused about uh, participation in also in a good way. Okay, sometimes it's not good to involve uh, like the citizen. Sometimes it's not good to involve the farmers. In many cases, uh, there, is, there are also green zones like the, the, the this uh, whole uh, huge uh, group of rural development experts that they are not political uh, decision makers, but they are not even local uh, uh, villagers. They are people that have a relative knowledge about the issues that can give you a clear picture about the issues of a country. And uh, you have just to ask them and rely on their technical knowledge. Of course, that was a very short study, a limited approach and so on, but really it helped us in disclose some interesting information that to, to some extent can give to people working in Myanmar some additional idea. And also we made a short paper also out of this. So, I mean, the approach was not so uh, like, uh, uh, it was it's what kind of a robust approach anyways even if it, it was not that uh, that elaborate like the previous one and uh, <clears throat> as a conclusion i i can say that if, if you work with participatory research um, you may see how you can produce better decision making in water management uh, using the knowledge of different actors, including also experts. You are not forced to do participation with local uh, villagers. You can do also participation with experts. In uh, Ethiopia, it allowed better design. In, in Myanmar, it allowed getting only more information, which were very valuable. And usually participatory research uh, is a, a convergence of two perspectives the one of science and the one of uh, practice. Uh, I just want uh, uh, to give you an additional point. There is no time uh, to uh, basically talk about this, but uh, participation is not always easy. And in a seminar of 45, 50 minutes, uh, you cannot explain this, but please take into account that in all communities, you may also have a fight. You may also have different uh, political groups. They have a contesting interest and so on and so forth. So if you engage with a group of people, 
you might find problems because maybe the group of people is not uh, is not unite so this thing uh, work in ethiopia so we didn't have this work in it with this issue in ethiopia because in ethiopia basically the community of farmers working on the spate irrigation system was a community of farmers very unite because they work every year together for rebuilding the the structure and this is testified by numerous studies made on, on this kind of irrigation why in myanmar basically we didn't have uh, uh, an impact uh, dealing really with uh, with uh, politics okay we, we just uh, um, interview and, and engage with uh, rural development officers to, to get like an overview of, of the issue about myanmar but, but i mean if you deal with uh, a lot of participatory processes you may have uh, actually uh, some problems related to the fact that not all the people they have the same objectives in in land and water management so this should be taken into account i will be happy i mean to give you more information about these issues maybe in the question time the last time that i want to say about these uh, two projects uh, allow me is that both Ethiopia and, and Myanmar in this phase are in a very complex uh, political situation so I mean this is just to sensitize the audience maybe if, if you want to know what is going on uh, I, I would be happy because sometimes I mean you, you, you only think about these places like places where you did research but unfortunately in this latest year there is a lot of problems going on that um simone can i make you a question yeah sure so i mean i had these two examples and 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 we can conclude here but but maybe if the audience in, is interested i i have another final example about italy that can be of interest so i mean if you allow me some flexibility let me yeah know yeah sure it. we can take five minutes more and then we have already have two questions in the okay. chat box okay final uh, extra let's say case study is about one study that we did in, in italy this i would say is is less participatory research because this was really an analysis supporting uh, policy making and this is an analysis that we did uh, in italy centered around the concept of water related to consistent services which basically are uh, the multiple benefits produced by the interaction between water and terrestrial ecosystem you know that uh, i mean maybe you are in, uh, in in touch with the concept of ecosystem services uh, that that they can be divided in four phases in four uh, classes or supporting ecosystem services or supporting water ecosystem services so, so the ecosystem services that support water habitat provisioning uh, water ecosystem services provision of water for food or water for energy regulating water ecosystem services like uh, flow and sediment regulation and cultural water ecosystem services provision of uh, cultural values religious values, tourist values, like beautiful lakes. I mean, this is water that is deploying a water ecosystem service. So the objective of, of, of uh, this project that we realized uh, in uh, the River Erno Basin in Italy was to try to use the concept of water ecosystem service to encourage citizen participation about decision making on water resource management, specifically targeting two objectives of the water framework directive. So water framework directives encourage the participation, but also, as, as you know, the main goal of water framework directive is, is to have a good uh, ecological status of, of, of rivers and this of course uh, encompass the, the production of water ecosystem services so it was very interesting at this point to try to use the concept of water ecosystem services with citizens to ask them how is your river is is the river producing good useful ecosystem services or there are problems and we made uh, this test so basically uh, we aim uh, 
uh, at an analysis of water ecosystem services provided by the land use and, and the water resources in the Frigina and Incisa municipality that is in Tuscany on the river Arno, which is the river passing to Flores, and to carry out an analysis of the society perception of, of water ecosystem services and to develop a framework for water ecosystem services evaluation. So this was a little bit the study area. You see where is the, the river in Italy and where is the municipality. And the municipality, which is this one, is really on the river. So this is the river and these are the tributaries. So it's basically overlapping with uh, some uh, sub uh, catchment tributaries within the river Arno. And we realized for a step, a preliminary phase, a stakeholder identification phase, focus group, focus group discussion, and some analysis of future scenarios. So what we did, it was very interesting. So we tried to have a, a, a huge participatory approach with all the community of the municipality, and this completely failed. Because people, they did not have time to join us. So completely different setting from the two previous example. Two previous example that I gave, there were an irrigation system and a group of uh, officers, rural development officers that were doing a course for the career. So people that were totally willing and they had a lot of time to participate because the participation topic was their own life or their own livelihood. Here it was completely different. So of course, uh, these people, they were living in the municipality and they were living with the river, but no one was a professional or no one was a worker with water. So what we were forced to do is, is that we, we didn't organize a, a very huge uh, assembly for participating, but we identify four association on the territory and we went there and we joined their uh, moment of assembly. So we take part to their assembly and we try to interview them about uh, this issue. And the thing was extremely successful. So these were the association uh, interviewed and uh, we realized an inventory of water ecosystem services. So basically for each type of water ecosystem service, we identify the type, we, ident we identify a little bit the description we check which water body was producing the ecosystem services, and we evaluate which uh, ecosystem service was in a bad status and why. So you see here that, uh, especially in, in, in this uh, municipality, the recreational ecosystem service, uh, so the, the, the cultural value of water on the river was perceived as a very low ecosystem services because there is a lot of pollution and because the riverside area is not accessible. And we did uh, this uh, approach with different association. These tables is basically the aggregation of all the information. And you see that we managed to get a lot of information about uh, which kind of environmental issue related to water was present in the territory and which were the detail problem. And we also managed to create a map of, of uh, these ecosystem services, because basically with uh, the support of Google Earth uh, during this uh, discussion, we allow people also to identify which were the most uh, important uh, areas where uh, the water was producing an ecosystem service. So here is a little bit of examples that we found. So finally, we realized, uh, because we really had uh, a huge amount of information at this point, and uh, we also had a lot of citizens that uh, they were active in the process, even though they didn't have time to attend to, to general meetings, but we went to them. We tried to check with them if they were interested and they were interested, they just didn't have time, okay? Not like the farmers or the rural development officer that are dealing with water by their own job. 
And, and thanks to this huge amount of, of, uh, of information, we had quite a strong critical mass of data and the perception, but also analysis of the perception with reference to the biogeophysical system, because of course we did a lot of cross-checking be between the participation results and the, and the reality of, of, of the river, and, and it was matching. So we had uh, a meeting in the municipality, also involving uh, the, the river basing uh, district. And what we, uh, what we present was the joint analysis of the water ecosystem services scenario. And uh, basically we try to implement all together at this point, citizens, but also uh, experts of water management. We try to develop potential corrective action so basically payment for ecosystem services approach, namely paying people to keep uh, uh, the pollution level low or uh, to establish a better uh, uh, riverside management plan, but also to encourage uh, the adoption of river basin contract as, as a standalone measure to manage this, uh, this kind of, of uh, uh, areas along the river. And, and then we also um, ask to analyze uh, with additional hydrological studies, uh, some uh, issues that were presented by the population, but they were not totally clear. So from, from, from this last uh, um, project, uh, we actually get another insight. So sometimes, and I understand this might be a difficulty if you work, uh, uh, in, in participation, but is not uh, likely very strongly related to the everyday work and the everyday life of, of the people in a strong way, you may not get uh, a lot of uh, presence. Uh, and in this case, uh, I mean, you should take into account that people in their lives have a limited amount of time. So sometimes if you have a group of people that are already caring about the environment or maybe caring about other topics, about other things, but they, they use their time to meet, maybe it's better to use the depth meetings and, and to be available to discuss with them rather than expecting people to be always available to discuss with you. This is another misconception about participation. If you organize one meeting, people will come. And the question is why? If someone in your uh, university would organize a participatory meeting tomorrow about some kind of issue that you care about, but you are not expert, like food waste, would you have time to go? And the answer is probably no, even if you care a lot, because maybe you have meetings, you have things to do and so on. So this is another insight that I wanted to share with you about uh, participation in natural resources management project. And it costed us a lot of work, but in the end, with this experience, we, we managed to get an additional tool to conduct this project in a proper way. And then uh, additionally, of course, uh, we, we realized that water ecosystem services was a very good tool to uh, make people aware about the multiple role, the multiple uh, um, benefits of water and, and, and it really help uh, also people that were not expert to, to view which can be all the problems, not only the one that they, they were mainly related to their area or their uh, um, team and so on. And, and again, here yeah, we did a little bit of project dissemination, so everything is available. And now I really finish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. It was very interesting. We have uh, some, say, long questions, so I go uh, directly to those questions. Uh, the first one by Sohail Mohammadi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Considering the fact that participatory approaches would be beneficial in case of including of the experience of the community, which is mainly based on their lifetime experiences, limited to their lifetime and community's memory. Don't you think that sometimes it would lead to underestimation of the risk in disaster risk management decisions? 
take into account not only climate change and intensification of some natural hazard, but of course the fact that maybe involved community uh, have been forgetful about very past experience? If so, what measure could be taken to prevent? Okay, no, that's a very good question. And uh, if, if you want, uh, uh, forgive me about saying that, but, but it's, it's maybe a little bit uh, not enough uh, well developed in, in, in the memory thing, okay? Um, and, and, and I'm going to articulate this. And the, 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 there are two levels of answering this question. So the first level is that, of course, no, the, the first point is, of course, you have to always take into account, and, and this, uh, I didn't show it today, but this was done in all the cases. You have to always take into account that participation cannot be taken for granted. Okay, one very uh, important uh, tool when you do participation about natural resources management is triangulation. Triangulation means to take uh, the sources from different, uh, different uh, areas. So you never really rely about the information given by people, especially when you talk about uh, climate, uh, water, and so on. This is what we did in Ethiopia. I mean, if you read this to the study, you will see that uh, the information gave by people was cross-check uh, with some GIS analysis, larger scale analysis, and we use the information given from people only by um, refining the analysis itself and, and, and to talk about the issue. And, and this was done also in Italy because you didn't see it, of course, in, in this short presentation, but basically before the interviews, before the discussion, all the participants were provided with a booklet about uh, the, the biogeophysical situation of the river uh, catchment, the, the data, the figures, and so on. And this is a thing that you always do. But when you talk about memory, uh, you have really to understand uh, what does memory in hydrology means. And, and, uh, and, and also, the point is about what change the memory of the people about disasters. Uh, maybe some of you can know what, what, uh, who is Giuliano di Baldassarre, who is a professor uh, now is in Sweden, and he was previously in, in the Netherlands, and, and, he was, uh, and he was, he is Italian. So he did a lot of studies, some, something is also nature, so it's quite I mean, famous for researchers, about the memory of disaster link uh, to people's livelihood. And it demonstrated that it's not uh, the person themselves uh, that they forget about disasters. It's what it happened around them. A very common example is uh, their study about uh, Levis. Okay, so uh, it, it is shown that uh, in the communities that have strong uh, um, flood risk management and, and flood risk mitigation through infrastructure like Levis, they tend to forget quite quickly the, the, the consequences of flooding. Because thanks to the Levis, they don't have flooding every five years, they, they have flooding every 50 years. So this, this is why they forget about the disaster. They also made another, uh, the, another study about reservoirs in the United States. Also, this one is on nature. And, and they, they show how in, in drought prone areas where you build uh, reservoirs, uh, you don't have uh, moderate drought events uh, every 10 years. But when you have a severe drought, it's actually worse because people lost their experience about getting close with drought. Okay, so, I mean, of course, they, they do not propose a solution. Of course, the solution is not, let's stop making reservoirs. But this gives you a little bit how 
the memory of people is not only linked uh, to the nature, but it's linked to what you do. And uh, specifically in our cases, uh, we were a little bit confident because we were working in places uh, where people, they really have uh, a constant contact with the hydrological dynamics. This is why they can give you good information about disasters. Of course, it's like in Florence. In Florence, we had uh, an, an, a flood in 1966. So no one of the people of my generation, they really know where to escape if there will be another flood. Because after 1966, we had a huge amount of, of uh, hydraulic works to prevent flooding and no one has seen a flooding in his life. Okay, so this is why, I mean, of course that the question was well posed, but in our cases, uh, we managed to get good information in, in, in Ethiopia and Myanmar because the situation was difficult. That, that's the key. Sorry if that's long, but- uh, Thank you, really Julia, good, very complete. Question. Uh, another one from Meron Lekiu Tefera. Um, that was my student, actually. Okay, I have just one question. Is the design in Ethiopia implemented? Do you get the chance to see the result after the no, implementation? No, no, actually not. And, and, and maybe Meron, since you know the political situation, you can know yeah, why. Complicated, yes. No, but, but the, the point is that, uh, I mean, yes and no, yes and no, because uh, um, at, at that time, there was already some gabion installed, uh, and, and it was clear that uh, the gabion system, they were working better, um, but, but we didn't really implement that, uh, that structure that we designed. So unfortunately not. Okay, thank you. Uh, one question from Marco Massabo. Um, in some initiatives that we are running, we are trying to engage local researcher and institution to support the exchange between scientific community and policy decision. Uh, we approach more as an institutional exchange. Did you have also included local researcher in uh, your participatory research in Ethiopia or other example? How did it work out? What is your experience? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, this, I will be very short uh, because um, I did not say this, but, but when I was in Ethiopia, I, I was uh, basically working within an Ethiopian university. So I involve uh, Ethiopian researchers because I was like an Ethiopian researcher. So I did not go there uh, uh, like uh, worker from uh, an Italian university, but but of course, if you see the, the names of the paper, you will find Ethiopian people. Basically, I, I was doing research together with uh, Ethiopian researchers. So yes, that was implicit. So probably the, the the results was so good, or maybe, I mean, apparently good, because then, uh, I mean, that was my work. And I have a few ways of judging it from external, but is because basically I, I was doing an internship in an Ethiopian university and, and, and this approach and this issue was kind of suggested to me by the Ethiopian researchers. So that, that the, the answer was short in this case. And the last one, and then we will close from Eva Trasporini. You mentioned as a starting point for implementing participatory actions, the need for defining a common background. We often face many difficulties in doing this, also when we deal with more classical approaches. This can be true also when working with experts from fields uh, far from us. Sometimes it's difficult to understand each other or obtain the trust for going on with the work. It will be interesting hearing sometimes about your experience in this field and the potential approaches to cope with these issues but maybe this, uh, this should be another thing. Okay. I mean, maybe if ever you, you write me an email, I can send you like a couple of good publications on the topic, but, but I will say let's meet in three years because I, we are now running a project uh, uh, with, with multi disciplinary competencies and, and it's a huge mess. So maybe in three years, uh, I, I will have some insight about this if we survive. But yes, it's totally right. And um, 
there, there is a, a lot of things that you have to learn about this, but, but it, it's an issue, especially sometimes it's more an issue when you have different experts, because if uh, an agricultural engineer goes with FART, uh, it, it, we are more close that maybe um, someone that is doing institutional analysis and an hydraulic engineer. So just, just to mention this. That... Okay, thank you very much, Julia, uh, for the very kind presentation and for uh, say your clarification and your answer. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, everyone who participated to this uh, seminar and I hope you see you soon.